Hello everyone, my name is Anna Brees. It is the 30th of May 2020. I'm about to do an interview with Professor Robert Endress. He is from um, Imperial College London. He's going to introduce himself in a minute. And just to explain, because I'm always transparent about how people got in touch with me, uh, Robert Endress got in touch and said, I'm a professor for systems biology, that is the analysis and modeling of biological data. And I very much appreciate your YouTube videos. Thank you very much for that. On the mm -hmm. Corona crisis and the lockdown measures, finally a sensible voice. Well, I'm just hopefully here to interview people like yourself who want to come forward and share any information. So we had a chat, agreed to do this interview today. And um, so first of all, why have you got in touch with me? Well, now, first of all, tell us um, a little bit about who you are, your experience and about your role at Imperial College London. And I may add that Imperial College London is ranked third behind Oxford and Cambridge. It's uh, incredibly uh, highly uh, highly sought after institution very very well respected mm -hmm. institution yes thank you anna for having me it's a pleasure to be here um so basically what i what i do is i i come from a physics background and um and like uh, many other people i moved towards biology to to modeling biological data and to to analyze data and to develop theories so the idea is here is that physics has to be very successful over hundreds of years to describe a non-living matter and now we try to do the similar thing for for living matter so we try to develop quantitative predictive theories and to to understand you know, how complex systems effectively work and it gives a kind of a unique perspective as well towards biology because um, you know you could come from different angles you could develop very detailed models if you come from a more a mathematical biology direction and then you have many parameters and it might be very, uh, let's say, difficult to determine all these parameters and to, to make predictions. And then you come more from a physics perspective, you try to develop very minimalistic models. So why did you say finally a sensible voice? What's your concerns or what, what information do you want to pass on about this situation that we're in? And the problem here is that we have a very one-sided um, uh, reporting about the whole um, corona crisis and the very severe lockdown measures. And you hear always sort of the same kind of people and their opinions. So what I'm basically missing is, and I think there's very little controversial about it, I just basically want to promote that we have a more, um, more open dialogue. Um, so it, of course, now refers to science on the one hand, and then also, of course, at a more societal level, because, of course, the lockdowns affect many different uh, aspects of life. And uh, then we should look at the whole picture effectively. You know, of, of course, um, you know, we have, we have censorship right now, we have sort of uh, limitations of our civil liberties. And, you know, these things affect us all. And so we have to, we have, to have a more a broader discussion about how things affect each other. You know, there are news reports about so and so many million uh, surgeries being delayed or canceled. I mean, these things have to be obviously factored in. I mean, there's nothing, nothing strange about it. So 2.4 2. billion, yeah. billion pounds per day is, is the estimate economists have put on the lockdown measures. You're right, and it, it, there is another story, isn't there? The lockdown deaths, and if you look at the ONS figures, there's been a number of excess deaths. Um, I think it's around the 50,000 mark this year, but only 30, around the 33,000 mark, this was a data from about two, um, two weeks ago, 33,000 yeah. were due to COVID-19, but the rest, they, they couldn't say. You know, so like you say, you know, dentists aren't open, and if somebody has got chronic pain, um, they may, there, there, there may be a lot of deaths happening because of lockdown. And obviously, not just that, we've got issues of domestic abuse. Um, livelihoods are being destroyed. Businesses may not be able to recover. You're right. You don't feel that this conversation is balanced? No, I don't feel it's balanced. Yeah. You know, I mean, I wake up in the morning and I look at the news. I mean, I do still look at BBC and so on. And of course, I want to see sort of what the mainstream things. But it's quite shocking, you know, these sort of numbers of numbers of deaths. I mean, for, all of a sudden we're looking with a microscope at who, who many, how many people die of, of this coronavirus. And as this, we wouldn't do this with any other process, uh, which is, of course, also um, creating risk. You know, we don't talk about how many people die in car accidents and all kinds of other reasons. So we don't have counters for that. And if you look at the statistics, all of a sudden you realize, you know, you have so and so many thousands of deaths of any kind of other process as well at the same time. And but we don't look at this kind of stuff. You know, you're, 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 what you're saying, um, you know, you work for Imperial College London. That's not their view. They've driven this data. They've driven this government lockdown. Professor Neil Ferguson's projections. Were you involved yeah. in that report at all? I mean, you. you no, no, I don't. I don't know him at all. I mean, um, 
I mean, I don't know. Say, I can't really say anything against um, Neil Ferguson in that sense because I don't know him very well. Or I don't know him at all personally. And all I know about him is this one paper from March, which was sent around, and I guess it sort of affected uh, public uh, policy. Um, but otherwise, I don't know him personally. I, I only know this one work, and I looked at this and I was a little bit surprised when it was sort of sent around or it was publicly available. And I looked at it and I was just surprised how how it quickly said in the beginning already said it would be about um, it said it affected um, um, public policy um, and of the UK and of the United States and I think some other countries. But it was a very sort of one-sided sort of worst-case scenario and. Whenever you do modeling, you know, you understand that there's no correct model and, and that you have to be very careful about, you know, you have to basically play um, devil's advocate yourself and uh, see all the sides in, in a paper, at least in the discussion. And that's what uh, peer review is for. And in that sense, in, in that case, uh, you know, this wasn't a peer reviewed paper. It was just a, a document which affected the policy making and there was no discussion about it. Why then? Why? 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 Why did we just all base it all on Professor Neil Ferguson from Imperial I mean, I don't know London? Why? What, yeah, I don't. I don't. Of course, I don't know what what went into it. Um, of course, um, he is part of, or he was part of this um, Sage um, uh, Governmental Advisory Board, um, and um, of course, there were many other people on this board. So I, I don't know to what degree he influenced it, but you know, he contributed to it certainly. And um, but of course, it's also. No. Yeah. I agree. What do you think about the difference? And I've noticed this is fascinating to me, is the difference views from professors at Oxford, Cambridge and Imperial College London. There's very different viewpoints. And it seems that Oxford are, are kind of more concerned about the, um, the models and the projections that have led to lockdown. And they are quite starting to question the science behind it a little bit more. Uh, what do you think about that? Have you been aware of this difference between different universities? I mean, I don't know much about not the Oxford team. I, of course, I have been watching all this, uh, um, the German um, sort of uh, media and uh, there are a lot of scientists, of course, internationally as well. I mean, there are many people in Germany, there are many people in the US as well. Um, John Ioannidis, for instance, from Stanford, similarly, uh, Michael Levitt from, from Stanford. And in Germany, there are a few people. So, of course, they all are more cautious, basically, in their predictions. I mean, they're sort of criticizing these lockdown measures. In particular, the, the, the lack of, of, of open discussion. I mean, we have to have an open discussion because, you know, if you think of locking down an economy, you know, uh, f you know, four days of lockdown, this is already basically a 1% of the GDP, the gross domestic, um, gross domestic product. And if you have five weeks of lockdown, this is already 10% um, roughly. And now we are sort of two months into the lockdown or more. So you can see how, how damaging this must be. So Absolutely. I mean, there have been articles. So, for example, in the Daily Mail, there was an article that said um, that, there, it, that this model has been criticised. Imperial College London statistic, statistical model claims to show transmission rates, predicts that the death toll will triple in the next two months, 288,000. Um, but it's come under fire from experts for shoddy code and dubious methods. You know, people have been coming forward. There are voices, like you say, all over the world. Are there more voices in Germany that are, that are kind of calling for balance and calling uh, and questioning this this decision is it more 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 in germany than and in this country yeah i mean for some reason germany seems to be sort of partially at the center of this whole debate um i mean of course it's a little bit a few weeks ahead of of, of the uk so that's one reason of course as well and since there's maybe also more a culture in germany of of demonstrating so there are a lot of demonstrations which of course is made hard now because of the lockdown measures and you see these sort of ridiculous images of, of, of demonstrations where you, maybe only 50 people are approved to go to a demonstration. And, and you know, you have to be here and then this other person has to be over there. And this is sort of how we demonstrate and it looks like completely lost these people on a big empty field. Of course, it doesn't do the purpose of the, of the demonstration. So, Have those so demonstrations I, come about because of these voices, these critical voices rising up through you know, pr medical professionals. And obviously I, I did a piece on my YouTube channel about how a group of medical professionals have got together in Germany, haven't they? Um, and put, produced a report, which I've put together in a video. Is it because that voice is louder on media? I mean, yeah, I, I, I don't know what's the reason. You decide a little bit what kind of news you watch. So I follow essentially the UK news and also the German news and the American news. Of course, I know there are some debates and, and um, especially on the alternative media. 
So this is what this is what's so fascinating for me from a media perspective. This is what I've been focusing on. I mean, I was watching the BBC. Um, I've got an Amazon Fire Stick, and I go the news, and the BBC will give a summary of the news in about a minute, and I'll keep an eye on that. And they they said in the news. Um, protesting has begun in Germany based on conspiracy theories on social media. That's what they actually said. And then the next day they said the same thing in their headlines, but it, so they said it's being fueled by politicians. So I'm seeing this kind of also conflict between the media and government, but you're right. What you watch will have an influence on how you view this situation of lockdown or herd immunity. So you're probably more likely yet, yeah, if you've been watching a lot of Germany media, to, to think that, that our approach now was too severe, we need to come out of lockdown. But if you're watching more BBC um, and Sky News, for example, and some of the, the national newspapers, you may be more inclined to think, for well, where I live, they're certainly not yeah. protesting. They've even asked for more lockdown. Um, yeah, it's all based on the media, isn't it? It's based on the media that you watch. People come out of the lockdown and they don't even want to go back to work or they don't want to even send their kids to school, which is absurd in my opinion. So, so, so that's, of course, an issue. I, I mean, feel very frustrated in that situation as well, that children aren't going to school and they are, there's no doubt about it, children are suffering. They are. And they're not socialising. And when they go back to school, there's concerns that this fear and has, been, has been hyped up um, by the media, whipped up, so that there's going to be um, this fear a lot of people won't even return to school when the schools are open. And when they do, are they going to have to social distance? There was a report on the BBC where a teacher said, if a two-year-old cries, I can't cuddle the two-year-old. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, and this is why I have got so much passion for and focused on speaking to people like yourself to, like you say, give some kind of sensible, balanced voice here. Um, and this is, this is about looking at all the different expert opinions, isn't it? And, yeah. and that's clearly what you've done. But you're a professor from Imperial College London. Do you have any specific opinions on that projection where half a million people were going to die unless yeah. we introduced these measures? 250,000 would die if we didn't introduce social distancing measures. What do you think of that projection? I mean, as I said in the beginning, you know, when you do, when you do modeling, you have to be very careful, especially if you develop sort of models of, of, of exponential growth. You know, because in this case, you know, even exponentially growing um, uh, pandemic, it's pandemic in, the, in the beginning at least. And of course, at some point, you know, the curve flattens off because there's sort of a finite number of, of people and of course and so on. But I mean, whenever you have this sort of sensitivity, um, while you can make a model which can describe the data um, which you might have of the exponential growth quite well, you might have a very good model even. It might fit the data perfectly. It might say the line might sit perfectly on the, on the scatter of the data. But these models are highly sensitive, so you have to make some sort of. Uh, you have to always give uncertain intervals, and you have to you have to see you know how different uh, sort of slight changes in parameters effectively um, affect the outcome. And and there have been also some modeling studies where you can see very nicely that you have a model which perfectly describes the data to some degree, um, whatever is available at least. And then um, at some point, you know, you try to predict if there are some basically some. So the maximum where things starting to flatten out again on declines in numbers of deaths or the numbers of infections. And when you look at these models, even if you have artificial data without any noise, so perfect data effectively, you can simulate this. So you can fit the data very well what you have, but then you're still very weak in terms of making the prediction afterwards because small changes in parameter values have a huge impact. So some of these small uh, changes in parameters might lead to a flattening and decline of the curve, and other ones just basically lead to some uh, flattening and then still exponential rise, just with a smaller uh, um, uh, sort of reproductive number or infection rate in case you have now implemented some lockdown measures. So, so you can have all kinds of outcomes, and you, know, you should be careful, I guess, to, to take the worst case scenario. I mean, you can do it, but then you should also give the best case scenario where things just turn off very quickly after a month later. So, I mean, you have to essentially, you know, it's sort of almost like a chaotic system, highly sensitive to, to the details and the parameter noise, uh, so the noise in the data and the parameter values. So, so, and this was what I missed in this early paper by, by Neil Ferguson. But, you know, as I said, you know, I'm sure there are other papers he wrote where he, where he did this. I don't know why it is like said in this particular paper, 
in particular, it states very early on that it was used to implement um, or to, to influence um, policy making. So that's, of course, um, slightly strange. But um, so, yeah, so, that's, so, that, so these models have these limitations and one has to be very careful about them. I think everyone who's done any reading is aware of that. And that's why so many people I know, citizen, just normal people um, on social media contacting me and pouring over this data themselves and they're looking at death um, rates and, and trying to early, work out. Exactly. I mean, very early on as well, I said, look, I mean, I saw these initial numbers in how the, the sort of media and also sort of say general thinking went into this one direction of lockdown and severe measures. I looked also at some data and I also looked at some data from the um, um, public health of England, you know, just sort of get some perspective effectively, you know, what is happening elsewhere in, in England um, around this time. And you see this very interesting, you know, um, oscillatory uh, curves, which describes the death um, over the years in terms of uh, just as a function of season or time in a year. And you see these seasonal up and downs. And every winter it goes up, of course, it's, it's the death rate. And, you know, you have in, during a normal winter season, you have sort of 2,000 deaths a, a month. And um, during a flu season, you know, 20 to 30,000 deaths. So, you know, there's these huge numbers out there. And one should then also you know, consider what else is going on and, and put it in relation to these things. Also, I'm not trying to play down, say, COVID-19, but um, one has to be careful, but one has to, of course, have this measured perspective. Of course, if you now, you know, claim some, some sort of make a remarkable claim that we have half a million deaths, um, then sort of the burden of evidence is on you. You have to provide this evidence. If you make a claim, then you have to back it up even sort of 10 times. And the more specific and more, uh, more extreme the claim is, you know, if you sort of start comparing it like in the paper with Ebola and, and, um, and the Spanish flu, so, you know, then you have to, of course, be, um, you know, have to provide lots of evidence that this is a good prediction of your model. So this is an, on you, basically, to do that. Of and course. And, and so, for example, in my life, a neighbor's daughter has been very ill with coronavirus, and I've just found out a mum who's pregnant and third trimester is very ill. So I'm seeing it in real life. So it, you know, it does, it is happening, um, mm -hmm. but it's balancing, getting that balance of opinions about the risks, because there are obviously risks both with herd immunity and lockdown, a balance of risks and being trusting the media that you're hearing. And I was at the shop just now, and as I walked past the independent front page today, COVID-19 spreading too fast to lift lockdown in England, sage advisors warn amid warm weather or public prompt public to flout the rules. Um, and it looks like there's three scientists have come forward and said that lockdown's being used too soon. But if yeah, I actual headline, then yeah, that's more fear, isn't it? And there's so much fear and it's like, oh, and confusion. There's fear and confusion. And I really feel yeah. that. I, I woke up this morning and you know, it's the first thing is more or less, I look on, the, on my mobile phone and I look at the news and I saw this, I think it was on Sky News, but maybe other news channels as well. And there was these uh, two scientists from the Sage Group you know, warning of an early lockdown. And I thought as well, you know, there was no argument provided in this article. So, so if you claim something like that it's too early, then, you know, you better be prepared to, to pack it up with some really uh, strong predictions and evidence for that. So just saying it, it um, say 40 infections per day or something like that, or, or you know, it, it's not enough at this moment. So, 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 so I mean, you know, it's, this is also kind of interesting because uh, it's the end of the term right now at the university and we, um, we examine our undergraduate students. They just basically uh, wrote their, their final year projects, the bachelor's thesis, and these are quite, you know, motivated undergraduate students. They're generally very good and they write their reports. And then we sort of mark them and then we in, um, uh, um, examine them in oral examinations in Survivor. You know, we, we basically, there are certain criteria certain high standards we, 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 we hold them up to. And, you know, these are essentially, you know, um, to make it brief, I mean, there's these, we have to show evidence for analytical thinking. This is sort of the standard scientific approach where you have a, a big problem and you apply the reductionistic perspective where you may make a big problem and divide it into smaller problems so you can uh, tackle them effectively and you do one after the other in a systematic way. And there's also then the, the second one is then the, um, Synthetic abilities, you have to show evidence for that. And that just means you basically, you know, take a bunch of different uh, angles, different measurements, different data, different sources, um, and then you combine them and you have to have a coherent, you get a coherent story out of it in the end. And the last thing is essentially the critical ability. 
and this is what I, what I essentially mean. So in a critical ability, um, you have to play devil's advocate yourself and you have to see all angles of the problem and you have to say, what are the limitations of my, my approach? What is the limitations of the data I used? Um, you know, sort of what would I do next if I had more time? These kind of things. And we ask our students, our, our undergraduate students, to, to fulfill these high standards. But then if there's something really important happening in this world, and all of a sudden we sort of, uh, you know, a, a, a buckle and, and just sort of give in and just sort of, you know, follow, follow one way and sort of group think. And this is, I'm, I'm personally astonished how, uh, how quickly it all went in one direction and without any resistance, without any questioning. You know, I just, I just, I just like the debate. I don't have all the answers, of course, and I just want to see, you know, there's one person saying this is super horrible and it's like the Spanish flu then I would like to see a couple of other voices which say something different and then this is a, a but then how would different. the government how would the government convince everyone of lockdown if the media had a balance that's it that's my question to you if we didn't we, see it on a if we didn't see it on the news that it was so important you know you, you have to push that message otherwise lockdown wouldn't have happened people wouldn't have done it does that make sense you would yeah. have had more protesting like in Germany I guess I mean, I'm not saying that the lockdowns in Germany were less severe. It was just slightly different because there are different areas in Germany, different states within Germany, which have their, their local rules and there's some confusion about it. You know, Bavaria is more strict than other places, let's say. Um, but I mean, I'm just saying, you know, if there's an open debate, um, uh, then, then whatever comes out of this debate should then also inform the policy. And if the debate goes in the direction versus the lockdown should be maybe revisited after two weeks into the lockdown, because it looks like it was too severe or there's some evidence now coming out that we are on the decline already and that other countries like Sweden are doing much better in that sense and we should be revisited and there's no need to have of course an open debate and, and then see some sort of consensus coming out but then on the other hand the government going completely in a different direction. Of course this direction of the government then should effectively reflect uh, whatever the debate is going on. So, well, we need to trust. I mean, I don't know anything about science. I know about communications and I know about media. I have to trust Professor Neil Ferguson. I have to trust Sage. I have to trust my government to make a difficult decision with a, with a, a huge amount of data and a situation that's clearly changed. I mean, this is 10 weeks ago since that first projection report came out from uh, Neil Ferguson, Professor Neil Ferguson. And now we're in a very situation. And, and it actually said we need to wait a few weeks and see where we're at. Well, we have now. And now we, um, unfortunately, the, 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 maybe the media have whipped up this frenzy and anxiety and fear and people are too scared to come out of lockdown. I mean, that's come across. So it's all about, I need to trust that those in power that I voted for are making the decisions in my best interest, our, be our best interest. You know, I've yeah, said I mean, before, I'm self-employed, a single parent, I'm struggling more than maybe somebody who's, who's, who's being paid and not working so much and having a nice time with their family. So of course I'm suffering more than others, but that doesn't mean that I should have herd immunity. It doesn't mean that's what's right for the country just because I'm suffering. Um, you've got to think of the collective, haven't you? And our collective is represented by our government who we voted for. Just I, I just want good media, that's all. Good balanced media. Yeah, I completely agree. Yeah, that's, that's the whole point. I mean, the question is, you know, why is the government doing it? I don't, I don't know. Why is the media doing it? I also don't know. I'm sure there are, there are certain reasons, yeah, but I, I don't want to yeah, speculate too much about Just finally, because people will want to know, do you, will you get into trouble with your, with your employer here, Imperial College I London, for not, your yeah. views? I hope not, yeah. No, I mean, I, 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 didn't, I didn't really mean to go after Niels Ferguson. I mean, I, I, I basically just, what I just want to have is an open debate and we, I just basically want to follow the, the scientific uh, process we normally have. So, of course, the public might now wonder, you know, why uh, why we have to have this debate? Isn't, isn't science either right or wrong? And that kind of thinking, of course, might be sort of, uh, you know, fueled by by the success stories of science. You know, you take um, Einstein's general uh, relativity theory from over 100 years ago, and it was some sort of landmark work, and, and there's no questioning about it that it was correct, and it did fantastic things. You know, of course, decades later, we realized what the impact of that was from, you know, having GPS and all these things and gravitational waves. But, um, but, 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 but normally, this doesn't work like that. Normally, what is happening is you write a paper and you have to, of course, you know, uh, be critical about what you're doing. 
and then you submit it for, for review. And then you have some people who you don't normally know and say, don't, say, you, you don't, you don't, it's these anonymous people who are reviewing your paper and say, don't, um, they don't gain anything basically, you know, so they're sort of completely unbiased, um, or at least have to, just have to um, uh, show that they have no conflict of interest, it's of course very important. And then, you know, you assume they're very unbiased and they assess it. And then, you know, you get the feedback and you revise your paper before it can be submitted. So, and this, um, this sort of discussion in science is normally done, you know, sort of behind closed doors, you know, you get your referee reports, you modify your paper and, and no harm done, you know. And, uh, but, you know, the public, of course, doesn't know about this, really. No. So it's just a discussion. And now, all of a sudden, you know, people might think, uh, you know, say, this is this work and this can't it be, this has to be either correct or wrong. And why, why has to be there as a debate? But this is just a normal process in science. And now it's very public. And it makes it look very strange. But, but this should just happen, yeah? So that's all I, all I basically want to do with this, with this little interview. So... So, um, so this is this is all I want, and I think this is not really even controversial. It's that's what we normally do, and that's what we expect our students to do. It's not controversial. In that, are you saying that we rush too quickly? That this there was too much power in the hands of too few? I mean, I, I don't know how how the Sage Group operates, and I don't know uh, Neil Ferguson what what he does, and so on. You know, Imperial College is eight thousand staff members. We have four. We have four thousand campus. No, four, we have four campuses and, uh, and um, as, uh, across London and we have, um, we are also sort of affiliated with multiple hospitals and it's a quick institute and it's, it's a very exciting research environment. But, you know, I, of course, I, I don't know every, every um, professor at Imperial College, especially I think Niels Ferguson is at it's medicine, faculty of medicine, and I'm in fundamental science. So I have very little to do with this, um, this medicine. So I'm basically in fundamentals uh, research and I'm you know more wondering about what cells are doing and uh, using my physics and engineering approach to understand what, what cells are doing and I normally don't work on on uh, on pandemics or epidemics even so of course no of course and I appreciate you talking to me and like you say it's, it's very very interesting to see that you've been watching more of, of it's a really the media you watch it, it has an impact on your views on 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 anything really doesn't it 100 percent and I know, um, obviously, the World Health Organization is very connected to um, Imperial College London. Um, sure, there's some big funded, um, large funded projects, that's right, yeah. Yeah, and obviously I, I Trump don't... has now terminated his relationship with the WHO. I, I don't have any funding from WHO, so I have very, a very small research budget because, as I said, you know, I work in fundamental science and there's very little funding, so... so and yeah, Dr. Not... Dr. Nabarro is... Um, is the WHO special convoy for COVID-19. He's at Imperial College London. But there is a link, very close link, between Imperial College London and the WHO. Because it might be the case, yeah. I mean, of course, I'm sure there are other links to other universities. I know there are a lot of links also to, to German uh, the Charité in Berlin and, and um, the, the Robert Koch Institute. So there's these big, um, uh, big uh, sort of uh, scientific institutions which also um, uh, sort of uh, advise the government in Germany. And of course, there are all these links with WHO. WHO. Of course, these are small amounts of money overall in terms of a budget of a university. But of course, the question is, you know, if people can be influenced by having small amounts. I don't know. I don't have any of this kind of funding. So, yeah. um, and just, just finally, just to ask, is Germany out of lockdown completely now? Um, I can't really even say this. I mean, uh, I mean, they're, they're basically getting out of lockdown. As I said, you know, the different areas in Germany have different. Um, uh, um, different uh, policies. I think they want to get out, and there sometimes, you know, from the from the federal government interference, and essentially when the local areas want to do their own thing, which they normally would be allowed to do in a in a federal republic. But you know, there's a sort of debate going in back and forth. But you know, even if there is now um, uh, people coming out of lockdown, let's say in Bavaria, um, you know, people now have to wear their face masks and, um, you know, keep their distance to people and restaurants also they're open or I think uh, they're sort of uh, at half capacity. And of course, this becomes all ridiculous. You know, we can't control all the risks in life. And why would we now want to control uh, this in, in a different way, how we control other things? You know, I saw a statistics um, said basically the risk under 65 to get uh, seriously ill from COVID-19 is basically the same as being, uh, um, you know, injured heavily or, or, or killed by a car accident on your way to work. And, you know, it doesn't mean now we don't drive anymore. And it doesn't mean 
you know, we're having a big motorcycle helmet in our car and the defibrillator next to us and stuff like that, or we don't drive anymore, or we don't fly anymore. We don't do these kind of things. So, so why do we behave different now, differently now with this kind of thing? And the, cool, the good thing actually is also that, you know, we have a nice uh, cutoff. You know, people under 65 are very little at risk. This is very low percentages. And then above 65, of course, these, these risks get sub substantially higher and we have to be careful about it, of course. But there's um, no reason, I think, or no severe reason now not to have the younger people go to school or university or go back to work. I, I, I don't see even the, the issue here because you could protect your, your vulnerable people and, and the, the elderly without um, leading to the severe lockdown, which we probably have to pay for the next 10 years or whatever it is. I'm not an economist. So. Well, I know for a fact we're going to look back in a year with some very different, in a very different way, you know, with a different perspective. And we'll yeah. look at, I think in the media, we're going to have to answer some very hard questions of themselves um, as well during this. When we look back and see what decisions we made, whether they were the right ones and the impact of those decisions. So um, I'll finish the interview now. And I just want to thank you again. Please do feel free to, to come back on the channel and talk to me. And I, um, really do appreciate you getting in touch and saying thanks for the work and I would invite anyone else like yourself um, who wants to contribute to the debate to get in touch with me and they can come on the on the channel because um, I think there is a desperate thirst and need for this kind of conversation. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we finish? No, no, it was, um, yeah, thank you for having me on the channel, yeah, thank you very much. And thank you for being on it. You take care. Thank you. Speak to you soon. Bye. Bye.